Ayn, A-Y-N, Rand, R-A-N-D. She was born in 1905 in Russia, so she's Russian, and she was educated in Russia, came to the United States, became an American citizen. She died in 1982, and I read this and I thought, interesting, her perspective before she died. Now, I'm not sure when she wrote this, but I'll just read it to you and see if you uh, recognize any of what she was writing about. It says, when you see that, <coughs> excuse me, when you see that trading is done, not by consent, but by compulsion, when you see that in order to produce, you need to obtain permission from men who produce nothing. When you see that money is flowing to those who deal, not in goods, but in favors. When you see that men get richer by craft and by pull than by work, and your laws don't protect you against them, but protect them against you. When you see corruption being rewarded and honesty becoming a self-sacrifice, you know that society is doomed. Recognize any of that? We sure do. She wasn't a prophetess, but she recognized where the nation was headed, the world was headed. Okay, a couple of weeks ago in the uh, pastor's letter I wrote to you, I quoted Revelation 21, verse 7. If you would turn there with me. Revelation 21, verse 7. Here we read scriptures that summarize God's great purpose for man and his creation in these few in this one scripture, Revelation 21 and verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God. He shall be my son. So the book of Revelation, as I wrote, is a story of God and of Christ, of man, of the church, of the angels, of the earth, and it draws it to a close with this simple, powerful statement described in this one verse. I said that now between now and the feast, I would like for us to look at what this one verse is telling us about God's plan and about God's purpose. In fact, it's, it's really telling us what God has in mind for you and for me. It has in it why we're called, why we must be given God's Holy Spirit. And as Peter asked Christ in Matthew 19, 27, Peter said, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? That's what Peter asked Christ. We've given up all of this to follow you what do we get? It's, an, it's a question that would be, any of us would probably ask that same question. Well, this verse reveals so much about what God has in store for each of us. It has four distinct, distinct phrases within it that we will be examining. He who overcomes, inherit all things, I will be his God he shall be my son. So today I'd like to start with this first statement. He who overcomes. It's the first one that Christ mentioned in this verse. So it has priority importance, at least to me. As I wrote in the letter, God has put us in a position in this world where you and I must overcome. We were born into this world that is ruled by, governed by, manipulated by, engineered by Satan the devil, who, as God says, is our adversary. But this is how God had planned it to play out from the beginning. We can't think that somehow Satan's rebellion disrupted God's plan for creating an eternal family. God didn't create the angels and then 
Satan came along and spoiled it all. So God had to revert to plan B. No, that did not happen. Look, we're talking about the one who inhabits eternity, as we're told in Isaiah 57, 15. There is nothing, and I repeat, nothing that can ever prevent God from accomplishing his desire, and that desire is to have an eternal family of God beings created in his image and born spiritually into that eternal existing family. That was and still is his intent, and it was devised and planned before the universe, the universe was ever created, as it says in several places, before time began. You can look up Titus 1 in verse 2, 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9, just two places where this is mentioned. But you know, as flesh and blood human beings, we want to know what the future holds for each of us, don't we? Biblically speaking, we've tried over the many centuries to figure out exactly how God is going to bring about the end of this age, to bring about the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And we've all heard countless theories and ideas about how this is going to happen. How many men have come on the scene predicting the reign of Jesus Christ or the return of Christ was going to be at this date or on this date? We're still here, aren't we? They were all wrong. They were all wrong. Even though we can recognize the end time season based on the prophecies and the teachings of Jesus Christ himself, we cannot figure out the exact steps that are going to take place, the exact date of Christ's return. Christ himself said, we're not going to know. I believe Christ. We don't know what it would take or will take to bring the end of this age. We know it's going to happen. We know some of the major milestones that must take place. We don't know when. These are all things we continue to study. We continue to ponder about these things from God's word, especially as we're coming up to the Feast of Trumpets, which signifies the return of Jesus Christ. But we don't know. We just, by faith, know it's going to happen. Now, it is important that we look at prophecy, but of more importance to us personally is the thought of putting prophecy into perspective with what God wants you and me to accomplish in our lives here and now. Knowing prophecy without that is not going to benefit us spiritually at all. What are we to accomplish? Do we know? Does God tell us? And this is in light of this statement we just read in Revelation 21, 7. That's why it's so important for us to understand what God is saying in that verse. He who overcomes. What does it mean? Why is it vital for our salvation? After all, in his messages to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, Christ said seven times one time to each of those churches, he overcomes, oh, he who overcomes will inherit or be given what? Be given what? We'll look at those in a little while. The definition for overcoming, and this is from the New Testament Word Study Dictionary by Dr. Spiros Zadiates, however he pronounces that. This is how he uh, defined from the, te from the scriptures, what it means to overcome. To be victorious, to prevail, to overcome, to conquer, to subdue. The word overcoming describes Jesus Christ and his followers as being victorious over the world, over all evil, 
and over all adversaries of his kingdom. The synonym for overcoming, the synonyms are to triumph, to have dominion over, to completely overcome, to cause somebody to be defeated, to be powerful, to be strong against, to control. What does God throughout the scriptures tell you and me that we have to overcome? You know, sin. Sin is defined in scripture in 1 John 3, 4 as what? As lawlessness, as transgressing, as breaking God's law. That's what God expects us to overcome. Now, the anonym for overcoming strikes a very discouraging tone. It is simply to be defeated. To be defeated. You and I do not want to be defeated by sin. We want to live our lives without sin. But to come even close to that state of existing requires what? It requires overcoming. It requires you and I going through this process of achieving a life without sin. A sinlessness life, if you would. Now this process, that's not a strange process just like we, talk, we heard about baptism. It wasn't strange to the Jew, Jewish people. On the physical level, we don't find this process strange at all. We all understand as we grow up in our lives, we continually have to overcome problems that come at us in life, don't we? You may have heard the story of a man who saw a butterfly struggling to escape from his cocoon. He felt sorry for the butterfly. So he took out his pocket knife and he split the remainder of the cocoon to make it easier for the butterfly to get out. Only to find out that now the butterfly could not fly. The reason for this was that his wings had not been strengthened enough in the struggle to come out of the cocoon like God created it to happen. And as he watched, he realized that the struggle was all important to the future life of that butterfly. Let that vision of that sink into your mind. It's a simple example, but it shows us that struggle is all important to life. And to our life at this time, it is very important because it is to prepare us for the future that God has awaiting for us. Having struggles in this life is necessary for us to build the spiritual strength, the spiritual character to be worthy of receiving eternal life. Of all people on earth, God has revealed himself to you and me in ways that the rest of mankind cannot yet comprehend. They just do not know because they haven't been given to know by God. They have rejected God's rule over their lives. Romans, Romans chapter 1. Here in Romans chapter 1, God says that, yeah, They've rejected me, but they're without excuse because God has sovereignty over all mankind. Romans 1, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what, they may, what may be known of God is made manifest in them for God has shown it to them. How has he shown himself to all mankind? Continuing, he says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, 
mankind as a whole recognizes there's a God or a being of some kind. They did not glorify him as the God nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. If you're like me, sometimes you just sort of shake your head in amazement that man can actually deny there is a God when he is able just to look around him and acknowledge that this just didn't happen. They want to believe it did through evolution or some other process, that that's only because they want to deny there's a creator God. It's the only reason. Job 12, verse 7. Let's notice what Job had to say in over here in Job 7. There's so much in the book of Job, we need to go back through that again sometime. Job 7, and verse, I mean, Job 12, verse 7. Notice what Job recognized here. Job 7, or I'll get this right. Job 12, verse 7. He says, But now ask the beast, go to the creation. Ask the beast, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. And the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? in whose hand is life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Does not the ear test the words and the mouth taste its food? Wisdom is with the aged men and with length of days understanding. So Job understood, he recognized that the creation itself should teach us there is a God who created all of this, but man refuses. And yet, with this amazing beauty and complexity that we see all around us in this world of God's creation, do we ever consider the lessons in the struggles that all created life must grow th go through to grow and survive? Struggles. Think of any creature you want in their life. Are there struggles they have to go through to survive and live? Yes, there are, just like the butterfly getting out of the cocoon. We're told in Scripture to go to the ant. How can we learn something from the ant? We can. Or to observe and observe his diligence, to view the ox and his strength, the lion with his kingly power. All of these created by God in fulfill, fulfilling His purpose for mankind. That's why they're there. For, man, for mankind. God expects us to tend and care for this earth and its creatures. But He placed within man a human spirit that no other creature has. We're different. We've spoken about this in times past. Only man was created to have an eternal relationship with God. This is why from the beginning, if you go back to Genesis 1, God gave man dominion over all living things on earth. Everything is under the dominion of man. They exist, as does all the physical creation, as part of the environment into which God placed man in order to fulfill his divine intention of creating his eternal spiritual family. Everything that's here, the air we breathe, the sunshine, the earth, the water, the, you just name it, all the creatures, they're here for us. That's why God created them. That's what he makes clear in scriptures. We understand the survival of the fittest. It's a concept that involved a little. The evolutionists have twisted and maligned. But we understand there are those in creation 
who have to develop skills to hunt, such as the lion. And there are those who have to develop the abilities God gave them to watch and be able to flee the prey of the lion. When we stop and view the creation, we marvel at the beauty. It's amazing. But do we often see the everyday struggle that goes on just beneath the surface of all that beauty? It's there. It was created to be there by God so that his creation could survive. Now, for mankind, at least generally, at this time, men and women are to grow and get ahead, but it requires what? Diligence, planning, education, work. Even doing, the most, even doing most things correctly when we are, unexpected trials happen. If you want to waste an hour or two, I'll tell you some of those unexpected trials that are involved with, with moving. Believe me, I've had a share of them. But there are. There's always personality differences. Political changes happen. Natural disasters come along and disrupt life for so many. Health situations? Yeah. Market conditions, if you're into the markets, ups and downs, job problems, pandemics? Yeah, they happen. Life happens. They're all there, and they all come, and they all must be overcome. It's that simple. If we're going to survive, they have to be overcome. Life is not smooth. It's not an easy road. It wasn't intended to be. The works of men, as much as man wants to think it is and won't admit it or not, but the works of men are all subject to God's will. Mankind feels that, well, he has a free hand. He has a free will in everything that he does. In all that man struggles with, there is a season, an appropriate time, which God appoints for it to be done. Where in Scripture do we read about this? Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. Let's just turn there. I think it's good to go through Ecclesiastes periodically. I think we did a Bible study a long time ago through Ecclesiastes. But here in Ecclesiastes 3, let's start in verse 1. It says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away, another generation comes. But the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down. The cycle, day after day after day. And hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The word season here means a fitting time for every purpose under heaven. Remember who sang that song? Solomon concludes here in verse 9 through 11. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, See, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come later. 
What is the purpose of our lives if it's not to develop the very heart and mind and character of God and Jesus Christ? We would have nothing. Nothing. That's what the world has. You realize how precious the truth that God has given us is? Precious. Beyond words, it's precious. But these struggles that man has to go through is something God has given to play out in the lives of mankind. Jesus Christ in John 15 tells us, You are my friends, therefore I have told you what I am doing. We, of all people on earth, have had the veil lifted from our face. We have a very solid idea of what God is doing. We see God's plan of salvation in the pages of the scriptures. The world doesn't see it. God, in his infinite wisdom, has seen fit that all men and women, all men and women live a life whereby they experience all that these happenings that happen in man's life. As, they, as Solomon said, that they are exercised by them. They're put through a routine with the things that come upon them. Doesn't matter, rich or poor, young or old, weak or strong, handsome or plain, all share in what we read here in Ecclesiastes. Situations that are just a part of being human, a part of living in the flesh on the face of this earth. 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, though, we see a difference being drawn. 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse, or just in verse 13, I think it is. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. This is another truism that God gives us, that we probably fall back onto far more than we wished we had to. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. Don't ever think that you're going through something that other human beings aren't going, are going through. They are. The same exact things. But God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it, to endure it, to overcome it. God does that for us. Mankind has to go through many trials. And to some degree, always, we also do. We have to share in those trials. Just as in fighting to escape the cocoon causes the butterfly to be strengthened, our calling requires an effort on our part over and above what the world has to go through. They're going to go through the same tests and trials. We have a better purpose for ours. To become free of Satan's cocoon that encompasses the whole world by its system. We who are called by God have to understand that God has a responsibility toward us. God has a responsibility toward us. He has brought us to an understanding of who He is, what He is about, the purpose of our lives, and the future that He wants for us. We couldn't know it otherwise, just like the world doesn't know it. But because of this, the Father and Son have a responsibility to see that we learn what is needed. God's desire, His purpose, is for us to be in His family. He's going to give us what we need to be there. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. Amazing assurances we read here in Philippians from God. Philippians 1, beginning in verse 1. 
Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in, in Philippi, and the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making a request for you, for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first, first day until now. Notice, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God started us on a journey to the kingdom of God. God is going to do everything God can do to ensure that we make that journey successfully. Psalms 138.8 says this, The Lord will perfect what, that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Forsake not the works of your own hands. You and I are the works of God's own hands. He has a responsibility to ensure that he does everything he can to help us make it into his family. You see, the Father in Jesus Christ, they know each one of us individually. They know what each of us need to accomplish in our calling. And they will always follow up to make sure it is completed. They know each of us intimately. They know our strengths, what little we may have. They definitely know our weaknesses. They know our abilities. And they know the future that they wish for each of us. And they know what they expect us to accomplish in our lives. They know the pressures that this life puts upon us. But with thoughtful care, out of love, they lead us through this life in a way that will develop in us the mind, the character, the love, the faithfulness, the skills that we will need to have to serve for eternity in the kingdom of God. That's what they're developing in each of us. We realize that God sees everything we do, and he knows our every thought. There's nothing that escapes God. He tells us that in Psalms 139. We want God to lead us in the way that is going to lead us to eternal life. No matter what that requires for each of us to go through, that's what we must want. God has just not called us and said, there, I've called you, you're on your own. No, it doesn't happen that way. He knows every single thing about us. He knows the good and the bad. And he's going to work to help us overcome that which doesn't reflect his character. John 14, back to the book of John 14, here in John 14 we read the plan of God, John 14 verse 1, God, Christ said, let not your hearts be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many mansions or positions or rooms, however you want to describe it. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And when I come again, I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Revelation 20, verse 6, we're told that we're going to rule with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. So do you think God is planning for that thousand-year reign by the saints right now, today, at this moment, as you and I are here together on his holy Sabbath? Yes. He's training us. He's preparing us for that time when we will rule with Christ in the kingdom of God. Is that real? Is it real? I hope it's real for every one of us. 
He knows who we are. He knows all about us. And he's developing within each of us what is needed for us to be able to rule with him for eternity. He's going to cause us to grow in areas that are needed to fulfill the goal he has in store for each of us. But we have to be willing to submit to his control, his direction in our lives. Oh, changes the dynamics a little bit, doesn't it? Be nice if God just gave us that. No, we have to do our part in making sure it happens. Nothing can deter God's purpose for each of us except our refusal, refusal of his calling. Except our refusal to overcome sin. He won't bring us into his kingdom with us kicking and screaming against him and his will for us. We won't be there. So what does being successful at overcoming provide to us when we ask the question that Peter asked Christ? Well, I mentioned Christ's messages to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 13 earlier. In each of these messages, God tells us what he is offering those who overcome. He tells us to hear what he says to the seven churches. And after we hear it, we are to apply his words to ourselves. And we are to spiritually grow from these instructions. These are not past instructions to a past people that lived centuries ago. These are words for God's people today, right at this moment. That's why they're there. They're just not history. They're for you and me right now today. We want to go through these quickly. I don't want to try to analyze each one. We could do a sermon on each one of them and have people have done that on them. But for lack of time, I'd like to focus on the rewards for those who overcome. Now, I am going to spend a little more time on the first church in Ephesians. So if you turn to Revelation chapter 2 in Ephesus. <coughs> Revelation chapter 2. The messages from Jesus Christ to each of the seven churches. Revelation 2 verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. So right at the beginning, Christ congratulates this church on their labor, on their perseverance. They had the patience to endure over the years, waiting for Christ's return. They knew their Bibles. They did not bear those who were evil. They recognized those who were pretentious and puffed up. They were not led astray by them. They wanted no part of such people. It's exactly the way you and I must be. Verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. You see, they had lost their first love for God the Father and Jesus Christ. When you and I look back to when we were first called, our love for God was great. We were excited about everything we were hearing and learning that God was revealing to us. Each month we faithfully made out our tithe check, making sure we gave God the tithe first and then we paid our bills. We worked to keep the Sabbath as holy as we could. We loved God. And it was so important for us to carefully please God 
in everything we did. At that time, there was an excitement. An excitement in our lives over our calling and over all that God was doing and all that he would do to heal this world and bring about the wonderful world tomorrow. It was an exciting time. I know every one of you can remember that time. But over the years, have we become tired? Have we become worn down waiting on Jesus Christ? We talked about that some last Sabbath, didn't we? Have we become technical, factual? Have we become focused on prophecy? In doing so, have we lost or diminished the most important aspect of our calling, which is our humble, tender love for God? Do we recognize what that means? Maybe we have unconsciously let down on the commands of God that early on in our calling, we so much wanted to keep as perfectly as we could. It's a serious question. It's a serious question I have to ask myself. It's a question you have to ask yourself. Here to this church, Christ comments on their strong points in that they had worked and persevered through an abundance of trials. Most of us have been around a while. We have faced our share of trials, haven't we? We have fought to stay with right teaching. We have not been pulled away by the enticement of men seeking their own following. Those wolves in sheep's clothing, as they're called, seeking to devour the flock of God. First John chapter 4. Keep your place here in Revelation. We'll be back in a minute. First John chapter 4. Yet there is another love that will fade away if we lose our love for God and His ways. 1 John chapter 4 in verse 20. If someone says, I love God, but he hates his brother, he's a liar. For he does not love his brother, he who does not love his brothers whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Love for God and love for one another cannot be separated. They cannot be separated. They're one and the same. 1 John 5 2 says that we have love for God's people when. We love God and keep His commandments. Have we worked so hard technically, striven so diligently to stay faithful to the doctrines over the years, over a long period of time, that somehow the love for the brethren, the love for one another has waxed cold? Have we fallen out of love with one another? What does John 13, 35 say? What are we known by? Our love for one another. Does God recognize us as his people? Eight times in the New Testament we're told to love one another. How much effort are we putting in to expressing that love? Some are doing it a lot. We can always do more. Back to Revelation. Notice what it says in verse 7 of chapter 2. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes. To him who overcomes. If we diligently work to get back to that first love, 
that first zeal we had for God and His words, that first love and concern we had for one another, this is what we will receive. He who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Takes us all the way back to Genesis, doesn't it? The two trees. The tree of life. And we could talk a whole sermon about what that means. Well, let's go on for the sake of time. I'm just going to summarize these other six for you. Verse 8, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came, and, and came to life. What Christ tells Smyrna, what he is telling you and me, to be strong in your priorities toward God and have courage under persecution. Courage, strength. It's easy for us to obey God now, but times ahead are prophesied for God's people to, that we will face much more difficult, much more challenging times. Difficult times in which we must remain faithful. He says, if we overcome, if we stay faithful, do not compromise, do not give in, he says, we will receive we will not be hurt by the second death. What is the second death? Eternal death. In other words, we will receive eternal life. Pergamos. Christ tells us not to compromise the truth because of those who hold and push false and liberal teachings upon us. If we overcome, do not succumb to these liberal teachings, to these false teachings... God says we will receive some of the hidden manna. What is that hidden manna? Who is the bread of life? Jesus Christ. It says we'll be given a new name as members of the family of God in the true image and likeness of God, of Christ. Thyatira, we're told to hold fast to the truth even though persecution from outside the church may be heavy. It says, do not compromise. Do not associate with those who pervert the truth. He says, if you overcome, you'll be given power over the nations as eternal servants under Jesus Christ in his kingdom. Sardis. Through Sardis, God is telling us, wake up. Arouse ourselves. Get busy with the right godly works. Change the lazy way we may have been treating our calling. If we overcome, he says, we will be clothed in white linen. White linen that represents God's righteousness. He says, our names will not be blotted out of the book of life. Philadelphia. God tells us to hold fast to what we have. Do the work. Work to increase your strength in all obedience, respect, and deep love for God and for one another that your crown may not be taken. If we overcome, we will be made pillars. Pillars that hold up and support the temple of God in New Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. And then to Laodicea. We are admonished to purchase the purest of God's truth, even through trial, and to do it with humbleness, with zeal, with love for all of God's instruction. To fast often that we might not have an elevated image of ourselves because of our own intellect, our own in success that we think we might enjoy. If we overcome. We will be granted to sit with Christ on his throne, sharing is his eternal rulership over the kingdom of God. Peter asked, what will we get? There we just read what we will get. 
It's interesting to note that the two churches that have the largest problems as we read them are the two that received no persecution. Sardis and Laodicea. In other areas, persecution for doing the work of God, for striving to obey God's word, drove them either to God, if you go through and look at those individually, or it separated them from God. What about us today? Are we being persecuted for our faith in God? Any of us really persecuted for our belief in God and our faith in God and following God? Or are we being persecuted by the lack of persecution? Are we being persecuted by the lack of persecution? What do I mean by that? You know, this could be the most deadly era in which to live spiritually since the beginning of time. This is a time of great satanic and worldly subduction. We live today in a hedonistic, pleasure-seeking, self-centered, no-holes-barred society. Recognize it? Yeah. As far as the world is concerned, God's not around. God's just gone off somewhere if they even thought about God at all. He doesn't care about the creation. Ours is an environment that screams, let down. It's all right. God doesn't see. God doesn't care. Do we like Asaph in Psalms 50, 73? Do we look at how the evil in this world seems to prosper and wonder why God continues to let it be this way? Does it cause us to forget who is this world's ruler? And anything from him is not to be desired. I would suggest instead of looking at how the wicked prosper, how they tend to prosper, maybe we need to be taking this time for each of us to look at ourselves. To look at how we talk. To look at how we think. To look even how we dress. Everything that makes us who and what we are, we need to be continually looking at to see if it aligns with what God wants to see in each of us. Nothing about us can be ignored. We can't say, well, that part of my life I won't look at. God knows it's there. Ask ourselves a question. How much have I become like the world? Do you see the world in any of your actions, your ways, your thinking? When people see you and I coming to church on Saturday, do they see anything different than those they see going to church on Sunday? When your neighbors see you leaving your home each Sabbath, what do they think? Do they think, oh, they're going somewhere special? Or do they think, oh, they're going to the grocery store? Or they're going on an outing? Or they're going to be visiting relatives or friends? Is that the impression you give to people? Instead of rejecting the norms of this world, have we taken on? Do we reflect what we see in the world? When people see you, when they see me, when they talk with us, when they interact with us, do they see and hear a difference from others that they associate with? If we are overcoming all that this world's society, all that this world's religions, all that this world's culture entices us with, there will be a difference 
there will be a noticeable difference that people will see, that people will hear from the rest of society. When God commands his people to come out of this Babylonian society in Revelation 18.4, he isn't just referring to its religious practices. We of all people must discern between the clean and the unclean, between what pleases God and what pleases ourselves. We choose what our priority is. Nobody's putting a gun to our head. We choose it. What kind of nation, what kind of world do we find ourselves in? A world that God says, come out of this world. Isaiah chapter 1. Let God tell us what this world is like and what he wants us to come out of. Isaiah chapter 1. One of many places we could go to to describe the world that we're living in. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished, I have brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. He says the ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know my people do not consider. He says, alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. He says, why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. He says, the whole head is sick. The whole heart faints. Even the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. Like a hollow log. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed or soothed with ointment. In this type of environment, and this is what you and I live in every day, Does complacency set in? Do you think complacency could be a problem, a danger? Does the fact that the world seems to be going on with no correction from God seem to indicate that, well, you know, maybe God doesn't really care? Can this cause us to begin to take on the thinking, the behavior of the society around us, little by little, ever so slowly, thinking, well, God really doesn't see that. Or the fallback that we've all heard, God understands. God understands. Yes, he understands when we neglect obeying his words. And no, our own human reasoning won't give us a pass. And yes, we can ever so slowly become more and more like the world, especially in our attitude toward how we respect and worship God on His Holy Sabbath and any other time for that matter. Second Peter, chapter 3. Second Peter 3. I said earlier, God doesn't leave us without what we need to be successful to enter his kingdom. 2 Peter 3, verse 1. He says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So everything we need to know to help us overcome is right here in the scriptures. 
Peter warns us that the world around us is becoming worse and worse. We are to be mindful of the words spoken, to listen to what has been said by the prophets and the commandments of God's apostles. He continues on that knowing that in the end time there will be scoffers, as he says in verses 3 through 5, scoffers against God who verbally state that there is no God. We don't have to do what God says. You hear that? It's you, anywhere you turn, you hear this. But not only do you hear it, the population itself, by the way it lives, demonstrates that they feel there is no God. In a real sense, the majority of mankind will conduct themselves as if there is no God, there is no law of God. Law of God. In short, each one walks after his own lust. Those that say, where's the promise of his coming? And that's what people are saying. Well, Christ says he's coming back. He ain't here yet. You see, they're willingly putting out of their minds any thoughts that God created the very world that they enjoy living in. They want to live their own way. They stubbornly refuse to consider His Word and to listen to the voice of God's ministry. Verse 6. By which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. Even with all that we know has taken place in the past. The argument that man will have is that no, it's, it's not going to happen. This earth cannot be destroyed. This world's just too big. Man's too powerful, too knowledgeable, too smart. Verse 8. It says, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Christ hasn't returned. Time's just going on. Tick, 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 tick. They forget. God doesn't compute time the way man does. Totally different. Verse 9. He says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but He is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In verse 10, he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. It's going to happen. God's Word tells us very clearly what the end of this earth is. And the physical creation is going to be ultimately. He complete, concludes in verse 11. Therefore, since this is going to happen. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Direct question to you and to me. What kind of person does God want me to be? Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, he says, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Blameless. To be overcomers is what God expects you and me to be. We could say that knowing what God's plan and purpose for our lives is, it should encourage us to overcome. In 1 John 2.15, we're told, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Where's our love? Where's our love? John is saying, do not make this world 
with all its allurements, the object of our infection, affection. Don't be fooled by the lifestyle it offers. Don't let its philosophy pull you down. Don't let it influence you into thinking the way the world thinks. As overcomers, we must push back against the enticements that are thrust upon us every day by the society around us. If I were to ask you to start making a list of the things in your day-to-day -day life that come into your life that can impact your thinking, your acting, how you do the things you do, you'd run out of paper. James 4.4. 4. In fact, just a couple of pages here in James. James is pretty direct and straightforward in this. James 4 and verse 4. He says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world, that person makes himself an enemy of God. An enemy. I don't think any of us want to be an enemy of God, do we? Do you ever wonder why Jesus Christ wants us to overcome? Wants us to be free of sin? Why? What's the purpose? It's so we can share in the freedom that God and the Father and Jesus Christ enjoy. That's what they want us to have. Freedom from sin. Freedom from the pulls of the flesh. So that we can have eternal life, as it says in John 17, 3. So that we can be qualified to live eternally, eternally as they do. And he knows without this we would not be able to fulfill the awesome future that he holds out to each of us. In this world, yeah, it's difficult to overcome. It's difficult to be free of sin. Can it even be done? Can we have victory over sin? Yeah, we can. I'm going to read to you Romans 8, verse 27 and 29. I'm going to read it from the New English Translation. Romans 8, 27, 39. With all this in mind, what are we to say? If God is on our side, who's against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And with this gift, how can he fail to lavish upon us all that he has to give? Who will be the accuser of God's chosen ones? It is God who pronounces acquittal. Then who can condemn? It is Christ who died and more than that was raised from the dead. Who is at God's right hand and indeed pleads our cause. Then what can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or hardship? Can persecution, hunger, nakedness, peril, the sword... We encounter death for your name's sake all day long. As the scripture says, we have been treated like sheep for slaughter, and yet, and yet, in spite of all over in spite of all, overwhelming victory is ours. A huge victory is ours through him who loves us. God the Father and Jesus Christ have a responsibility to bring us through. Our responsibility is to cooperate with them by willingly overcoming everything that comes against us. He continues in Romans 8:38 and 39. He says, I'm convinced there is nothing in death or life, in the realm of the spirits or superhuman powers, in the world as it is, or the world as it shall be, in the forces of the universe, or in the heights or depths, 
Nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we do our part in overcoming, in taking on the very mind of Christ, letting His mind be our mind, we can't fail. We can't fail. Christ said in John 16, 33, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Christ overcame the world. Make no doubt, God the Father and Jesus Christ, they have set as their goal, their purpose, their desire for us becoming members of their family. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God. 